So yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, Croft Gardens, uh, Cambridge. It was an Anglo-Saxon cemetery. We uh, went out there almost straight after the first lockdown. So, I mean, it was exciting, but also leaving the house for more than 10 minutes was pretty <laughs> exciting. So, uh, um, And um, I won't tell you loads about the sort of uh, on-site COVID measures we put in place because we've, uh, I think other people are kind of covering that, but I'll, I'll go through like a bit of the sort of publicity we did differently and maybe things that made a difference to the site. Oh, I should, uh, what, how do I make it, uh, you know, change? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, technology. So yeah, it was uh, Anglo-Saxon Cemetery to the southwest of the town centre in Cambridge. Um, we'd been there initially uh, for some trial trenching. Ah, uh, yeah, they, um, they'd been a heritage um, asset assessment and an evaluation but like the most exciting thing for me anyway is like x almost marks the spot i mean <laughs> like you don't get sort of so we were we were hoping for some anglo-saxon burials but um we actually uh i don't know can you see it all right it says a uh, anglo-saxon burial ground <laughs> in case you can't um, and there's a big cross uh, on the site um but actually, uh, in the initial evaluation that was done around the building, we only found um, Iron Age and Roman ditches. Um, and then we came back for a final phase of evaluation and mitigation. And we found uh, burials in this trench. Um, but they were unconfirmed as Saxon at that point, even though it was quite likely. But there, there's a Roman and Iron Age in the area too. Um, notes and... And we found around 70 graves, which was pretty exciting. Um, uh, and we defined the mitigation areas. There was uh, standing buildings here, and it's, it's part of a development for King's College, Cambridge. Um, so um, um, we were kind of working around builders, as is often the case. Uh, so we kind of define these mitigation areas and it's right on a busy road as well, so it's uh, quite, it was quite tight. Um, mm -mm -mm. Uh, yeah, this is also to say, um, this is where the big Anglo-Saxon burial ground was uh, marked on the map, but um, there were burials found here, like behind the big Cambridge sign, and also to the north of Barton Road and at the bottom of Grange Road, which is uh, sort of in the top right-hand corner of the map. So what we're looking at is possibly part of a much, much bigger cemetery. Um, you know, if we had 70 graves in our little corner, um, I can only imagine what the whole site would be. There were, ours were all um, inhumation, but at Croft Lodge, uh, they previously found some cremations as well. So, I said we, we did outreach a little bit differently. We're, we are, for Albion as well, we, we are a little bit behind the times. We're not very good at Twitter and uh, Instagram, um, but we're trying, we, we, we'll, we'll get better. But, um, you know, we, we couldn't fulfil our outreach component of the WSI in the way we normally would with perhaps site tours, you know, although they can be tricky anyway. Like, I don't know if you can take a load of kids round to look at skeletons, uh, if you can. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, Dave Ingham, who was managing the project, contacted uh, Rare TV, who make Digging for Britain, and said, would you be interested to come and have a, a look at our site? And I think uh, they spend a lot of their time on sort of more research-based digs and community digs, um, but because none of them were happening because of COVID, uh, they were keen to come to some exciting commercial sites. Um, although we didn't get a visit from, is it Corrent? No. Alice. Alice Roberts. Um, also because of COVID, sadly. Um, it's fine, it's fine, not sad. Um, but we did get the uh, cameras for a day and we also got given um, a little camera for ourselves to make a dig diary, which was super exciting for us. Um, and uh, I was a project officer on the site and I got to spend uh, a lot of time out there, which was great for me because Albion, the project officers don't uh, necessarily spend all their time on site, but uh, someone's got to make the dig diary. Um, so, <laughs> um, so yeah, um, and it was uh, super exciting for us. I mean, one of the things we also did differently 
due to COVID is, you know, you did, don't have the normal tea hut conversations, you know, where, where everyone kind of packs in and chats, which is really sad, but um, because everyone was so excited, there were a lot of conversations like sort of out of the back of vans across the, um, you know, over their cup of tea and like leaning out of various cabins about what people had found and things, even when it was raining. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was lovely to see everyone uh, so enthused. Oh, and then this is so there were <laughs> some uh, Iron Age ditches that the cemetery appeared to respect. Uh, initially, we thought they might be sort of late Romans, so there might be some continuity, but the finds came back as largely early Iron Age. And then there's a hiatus, maybe there's a little bit of Roman in the sort of upper fills, but it looks like they were um, still visible as earthworks, um, so the graves kind of sit around the top of them, but um, they're not contemporary. Um, I've written, I've written, respect the ditches, which I think my colleague was making a point uh, yesterday about how we should respect the, enjoy the sections. So I take a moment to uh, enjoy <laughs> these uh, ditches before we move on to the burials. Um, so uh, there were 62 graves and at least 69 individuals. Uh, they're on varying alignments. Uh, the majority contained grave goods, as you might hope, brooches, beads, weapons, glassware and ceramics. Um, preliminary artefact and radiocarbon dating suggests it's largely 5th and 6th century, so quite early, um, which is exciting as well because, like, as I say, there's previous excavations in Cambridge of graves of this date, but this is the only modern uh, sort of scientifically excavated cemetery of this date, although there is one to the... Uh, southeast of Cambridge Hatherdean, that's uh, Oxford Archaeology, have uh, been uh, working on and uh, publishing, and that will be great for comparison uh, with our site. Um, and um, because it's for the university, hopefully uh, they're more keen, well, they are more keen to throw money at it than uh, your average developer. So <laughs> it's exciting. Um, oh, you'll notice there's a some red stone lined graves. I'll let more on them later. More on them later. Um, so, this is a, a popular picture that uh, made the headlines quite a lot. Um, I mean, just, I don't know, I guess it's a good picture. So, it's a nice picture. The, the burial is like fairly typical of the, what we're looking at. It's, you can see it's got beads and things. Um, Corinne Duhigg. I think I'm saying her name right. Um, has been uh, looking at the human bone for us. Um, the preservation on site was also actually um, pretty good. Uh, like if you know, the soil is quite sandy, but um, they're, they're not bad. We lost maybe some of the kind of younger uh, infant skeletons. We had a couple of sort of empty graves with just grave goods in, um, and you know, a few with just sort of long bones and skulls surviving. But generally, it's pretty good. Um, 35% um, of the graves were of uh, immature individuals, suggesting perhaps we are just looking at sort of a particular bit of a larger cemetery. Um, um, and oh, there's a close-up. That's nice. For a lovely uh, square-headed brooch, which will come up again. And uh, there's a couple of small long brooches, which were the most common type of brooch we had uh, out at Croft Gardens. This is a, a female skeleton. 23% of the population uh, were identified as female. Uh, were identified, not identified as. I can see it. <laughs> I wouldn't know. Um, <laughs> uh, here's one of the male burials. And... Mike looking pretty pleased. This is one of the first ones we excavated. Archie there checking for, um, see if there's any more goodies in there, I guess, with his metal detector. Um. Uh, this, this individual was between 27 and 47, if you're interested. There was a quite broad age range from um, neonates, right up to, I think, 60 uh, and onwards, which I guess is pretty old for, uh, for Saxons. Um, there was no like uh, standard um, positioning of the graves. This this is uh, one of the more <laughs> uh, unusual ones. Uh, 
take, take, take your pick as to why someone would be buried like that. Um, apparently, the, one of the legs is shorter than the other, which may have caused like, some muscular problems. And uh, Corinne suggested it, it could have meant that was a more comfortable position in life. And maybe it's, but it's hard to understand why then someone would be <laughs> buried like that, unless they kind of positioned themselves in the grave which seems <laughs> unlikely. Um, but yeah, that was an un unusual one. I think we were, we were looking for the legs, and then you know, when you're sort of uncovering it slowly, and you're like, hold on, hold on. Um, doo -doo. Oh yeah, so I was going to say a little bit more about the stone-lined graves. Um, on the site, we wondered, th so these uh, stone line graves, they didn't have any grave goods like the rest. They were generally st stratigraphically earlier. Um, they had, uh, the, the bodies were um, generally supine, as I say, the other others were in various positions. Um, and, uh, and they were generally east-west as well. So we thought, are we looking at sort of a, a Roman, late Roman phase to the cemetery? And then you've got um, continuation of use, but, um, Actually, initial radiocarbon dating suggests they're the same date as the rest of the cemetery, uh, early Saxon, early Anglo-Saxon, which, um, which in ways is more interesting. Like the more data we're getting back, there's this sort of elements of uh, Roman culture coming in, and you know, so it's just we're perhaps looking at a, a population uh, like a Romano-British, with a strong connection still to their kind of Romano-British past. Um, and so, yeah, so perhaps peop some people still being buried in uh, an earlier fashion. <laughs> there we go. There's a, one of the stone-lined graves for you. Um, they also uh, displayed a number of, uh, what's the word, demographic and path pathological traits more similar to Roman populations. So um, the average stature was almost the same as that of Romano-British populations in the area, um, whereas the Saxon populations in the area are much taller, generally. Um, and um, a number of pathologies, I think specifically um, spinal arthritis, was much more comparable to what's generally seen in Romano-British populations in the area. So, um, you know, m maybe we're, we're getting, like I say, sort of hints that um, It'll be exciting to do the DNA analysis and, and find out where these people are from. Uh, another stone lined grave <laughs> and some recording going on. Um, as well as the stone lined graves with some of the um, more classic ang early Anglo Saxon graves, we had. Um, use of stones um, perhaps uh, initially we thought perhaps they you know some of the graves were cut through these earlier graves perhaps they're taking stones out and sort of re-burying them with people um, and but yeah you can see this this one's kind of resting on and then there were, there were a couple with um, sort of just look, what look like very specifically placed stones either kind of on the knees sometimes like kind of on the shoulder it's possible they were like markers of tumbled but they do seem quite specifically like place so this one you can see it's not great survival but that one there is kind of just on the on the shoulder and then that uh, the grave we saw earlier of the uh, male with the spear um, was partially covered whether it was fully covered but and um, uh, we'd lost the top of it because obviously there were former buildings here so there was quite a lot of uh, modern truncation, so they survived amazingly well, considering they've been uh, under buildings since the 30s. Um. Here's a nice one. So this is um, one of the older adults. Uh, it's actually the the. It looks like they were they were completely toothless by the time um, they died. The the bone has grown right over the uh, teeth, which is nice. Um, exciting. How am I doing for time, Helen? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so, just some pictures of some nice graves, really. Uh, again, prob probably I imagine the the pot was standing and has just fallen down into a, a kind of hat position. Um, uh, this is another male. He's got um, 
a shield boss down there and uh, the spear up in the top. Um, but also note the uh, it's a very nice glass claw beaker in the corner of the grave. Um, perhaps the most common type of claw beaker uh, dates to the 6th century, but they're still pretty uh, rare and unusual in the early Anglo-Saxon graves, and it's very nice. Put together there by Pieta at Draken Heritage. Um, and actually, this, this little glass flask was one of the most interesting <laughs> and exciting finds we had to find a such a nice glass vessel. Like I said, there was a lot of modern truncation. When, we, when it first started coming up, we thought we might have hit, um, you know, one of the, uh, there was some Victorian and um, rubbish pits and things. We thought maybe, <laughs> but no, it's, it's a, a small Roman glass vessel. It's a big moment in the dig diary. Um, yeah, it's uh, really uh, nice. And again, it kind of highlights the, uh, the sort of, Roman uh, memory in the population. It's probably been curated. Uh, it's uh, fourth century. Uh, the glass. It's uh, let me let me read my notes properly. So it's a greenish bubbly glass, typical of the fourth century. Um, the form is very rare. It's known in the Rhineland in the second and third century, um, but no examples have been found from the fourth century. Um, so yeah, it's uh, an exciting object that. Um, and it was also found, this was found in a, one of the graves of pr presumably an infant. Uh, there was no uh, skeleton left, but um, there was this and also um, a curated coin, Roman coin. So again, we're sort of finding little um, mementos, tokens that have been um, kept and then placed with people, perhaps uh, kept in families over the years. Um, I had the pleasure of doing a, a Zoom interview for the BBC um, uh, at home uh, <laughs> in uh, the lockdown. And uh, I think I waffled on about bury burying auntie with her best brooches or something. I don't know. I don't know. Never doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's more nice finds. We had some uh, nice shield bosses. Again, these are sort of early... Um, again, all the artefacts are kind of 5th, 6th century. Um, and Toby Martin's having a look at the artefacts for us. Also, he's looking at the Hatherdean, which will be um, useful for comparisons. Um, and then, this is, I'm just going to the nice pictures now. Some, some spearheads, very nice again, 5th, 6th century. Uh, some beads. We had uh, 708 beads, um, which pleased uh, Jackie, our fine specialist, no end, <laughs> individually bagged. And uh, <laughs> um, so uh, the glass combinations of beads suggest um, a lot of the population were perhaps uh, between 440 and 530. Um, um, AD, so like we're looking at really quite early um, Saxon burials. There were also some uh, miniature green glass Roman seed beads, um, which apparently is unusual in, a, in this kind of assemblage. And again, it suggests that there's Roman influences still hanging around in the population. Uh, it's a nice jet bead that I've chosen because uh, it's uh, showing sort of they were apparently, you know, low kind of regional trading and uh, yeah, the, the, the jet is quite rare. Um, there were a few rare examples, a lot of glass beads, a lot of glass beads. Um, I think they're all, I put that picture in because they look all sparkly. I think they were recovered from a sample, so they're drying <laughs> on a paper towel, but it looked nice. Um, so we're still sort of in the um, assessment phase. Uh, we're just coming around to, uh, so it's, you know, Still lots of exciting things to be learned. Um, there's a couple of uh, large pins. Apparently the pins got smaller towards the 7th century. So again, we're looking at early. Um, and a nice, some wrist clasps. Uh, they're not uncommon. We had 28 wrist clasps. Um, a nice girdle hanger. Apparently th these are kind of uh, often based on keys, but this is obviously uh, more decorative than functional, because uh, I can't imagine it working as a key, probably. Um, uh, relatively rare. How am I doing for time, Jeremy? Okay. <laughs> it's 
some nice disc brooches. I'm going to whiz through some of the finds now. Um, and saucer brooches. Um, these are more common sort of to the west, suggesting a connection with sort of, uh, Wessex. And we had a lot of nice cruciform brooches with the um, zoomorphic uh, figure at the bottom. Uh, this is uh, the, one of the nicest cruciform brooches. It's also the first thing that came up that was definitely Saxon uh, <laughs> when we were machining the site. So, you know, we were hoping the burials were Saxon and then this pops out. And <laughs> 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 um, mm -mm. Um, this is an unusual type of uh, cruciform brooch. Um, the only other example is from St Ives, which is just north of Cambridge, uh, north west. Uh, so it suggests sort of local, a local craftsperson, possibly. Um, and then this is the only great square-headed brooch we had, which is super exciting. It's, it's also um, appears to be a really early example. The metalwork is uh, more typical of sort of early fifth century. Um, but the square-headed brooch generally, they're, they're often later, so it's nice. And we've got a continental bow brooch, uh, suggesting there's some trade with the continent going on. Um, some small long brooches, these are the most common type of brooch we saw. Um, they made a big thing about this on Digging for Britain, if you, if you see the episode. Uh, so there's some mineralised textiles that have survived. There's at least two types of textile. This one, I believe, is a plain weave um, that suggests a more um, uh, up bigger scale production. So the other one is sort of maybe local, but this, this plain weave is a bit more fancy. Uh, so there were some quite sensational headlines. Uh, this, is, this is when I got a, did my Zoom interview. Um, I don't know if you can read this, this one from here, but I'll, I'll read, uh, read a little chunk of the... Archaeologists have called the hoard of grave artefacts one of archaeology's most significant finds since the 1939 discovery of the Sutton Hoo treasure hoard. Uh, <laughs> and uh, maybe may a little over-egging it. And the, and the, the Guardian, the Guardian. Um, me medieval hoard of treasures unearthed in Cambridge. Um, Come on, Guardian. Uh, um, I think uh, Caroline Goodson, Dr. Caroline Goodson at the university, actually sp spoke to the press, but I'm pretty sure she didn't uh, say any of that. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, thinking about sort of headlines uh, and the pandemic, if it, is it a good site or is it that there was good publicity? I think for us, it was partly the, it was through the university. You know, obviously, the TV is excited about the university. They probably have a lot more contact with Cambridge, so that kind of put us on their radar. And I think we've been contacted a few times since because maybe we're on a list now on a quiet news day. They're like, "We'll see, we'll see what the archaeologists are up to," you know, locally. Um, so we've been uh, contacted a few times since. Um, I mean, my personal uh, theory as to why this this site got so much publicity, like I went. Mean, Far and wide as well, like uh, publicity abroad and uh, some, some articles in America. Um, but I think it's largely due to the um, coincidence of the dig on Netflix um, because it's you know it's a contemporary site. So they were like, "Oh, this is great! We can we can interview archaeologists who are actually finding this stuff today." So I think, although it's a you know it's a, a great site, and there, but there are uh, other sects and cemeteries are available. Um, <laughs> You know, it's uh, um, they were also keen to kind of look at interestingly look at parallels between. Uh, so possibly these are people <gasps> who've lived <laughs> through the um, uh, the Justinian plague, and they're they're coming out of the Roman Empire. So you know, it's, it's like Brexit, it's like COVID. They were really keen on sort of drawing out those angles, but it does like it kind of made us reflect ourselves on. Uh, what it is to be excavating these people and like our, our current situation um, and like um, we we were working next to the uh, dean of the college lives next to the site and he often came out and chatted with us and he kind of asked us how we f feel about do doing this and I said well I, I thought actually it gives you a sense of perspective you know times are hard at the moment things are tough but you know people have been through a lot over the years and it, it gives you kind of a and uh, so maybe that's why people 
people, if they are like more keen on archaeology and it, through the pandemic, maybe it's that kind of sense of perspective looking at the past gives you. I mean, people were bringing up articles, weren't they, from various plagues um, through the centuries, uh, Shakespearean plagues, and so I think you know it, it's part part of that um, uh, a, a whole idea of sort of looking at how people have dealt with it previously and. Um, yeah, I think I think my time is about up, but uh, this is what's going to be on the site. <laughs> now, this is uh, the future of Croft Gardens. Uh, we're going to do a targeted programme of scientific study, uh, including further radiocarbon dating, isotope, DNA analysis. And so hopefully this is going to shed light on the origins and lifestyles of the individuals buried at Croft Gardens. Uh, and there's a, the university have created a fellowship to put the site in its context and uh, look at it further. So, you know, it's, it's great for us, like I say, a, a little bit more money than your average developer site thrown at it as well. So, it's exciting. There you go.